Mix 93.8, legendary radio for you on a Monday night as we do each and every Monday at this time. It's time for What's Involved. And my guest in studio tonight, I would say he needs no introduction, but uh, I'm going to give him one. Anyway, um, it is none other than Matt Brown from The Matt Brown Show. How's it, Matt? Hello, David. How's it going? Good. It's good to have you here. We, we had one or two hiccups getting you in here. All my fault. Uh, <laughs> let's just get that out there. All water uh, under the bridge now. But you're here now, and uh, i got to tell you, I'm, I was absolutely fascinated. On, on two accounts, you've got the, a, a podcast called mm-hmm. The Matt Brown Show, mm-hmm. um, which, from what I can gather, is a little similar to what I do, mm-hmm. but different. Um, and then you've got Digital Kung Fu, and then there's a bunch of other things. So we're going to get onto those. And I'm also going to ask you when you sleep a little later on because it doesn't seem like you do a whole lot. So uh, let's let's start off. Who who is Matt? Where does Matt come from, and what sort of journey took you to ending up doing tech stuff and a podcast? Because mm. I mean, podcasting in South Africa specifically is a very very lonely place to hang out. Absolutely true. One hundred percent true. Um, yeah, so I'm the founder of nine companies. Um, six failed miserably, lost the shirt off my back several times. Um, and two of those I built and sold, and this third one's looking rather peachy, digital kung fu. And um, basically, that was really uh, probably the biggest reason why I started the podcast because popularized media, business media was really portraying entrepreneurship in a way that wasn't entirely true. Having failed more times than I care to remember and obviously failure being not sexy at all, right? It's just you want the headline from zero to 500 million in (laughs) three years and no failure happened in between that. The uh, quickest overnight success that's taken the longest time, yeah. But that's what kids take out of it. You know, uh-huh. and so the podcast really was about connecting entrepreneurs together and letting them know primarily that um, that they're not alone and what they feel on a daily basis, the struggle on a daily basis um, is natural and normal. Um, and But the problem that, that really I've encountered um, is that the schooling system isn't really built to encourage an entrepreneurial mindset. It's like if you take failure, for instance, failure is not something that you do at all, right? You've got to get good grades at school, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, um, but in the real world, failure is, is necessary to become a success. Yeah, failure is an option. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they, the latest thinking is fail fast and fail forward. Mm-hmm. Um, but tell me a little bit more about Matt. I mean, you're not a Joe Berg boy. Mm-hmm. Where, were you, where were you born schooling? What, what made Matt into a digital kung fu expert and a podcaster? Um, I was born in Cape Town and then I pretty much lived overseas for the better part of 12 years, lived all over the world, London, started in tech at Accenture for my sins and um, part of the whole globalization movement back in the early 2000s, around about 9-11 and and then basically started a number of businesses. One was a record label, which was the first one that I sold. I was very young at the time, thought I knew it all, uh, uh, which was a completely (laughs) incorrect mindset to have (laughs) at any point in your life. (laughs) Um, And um, and then consequently uh, wrote a book about super yachts and how to get a job in the kind of travel and leisure industry. um, And that did really well. I started writing, wrote a very popular blog, uh, which got picked up by um, the media in the US. And that got me into America. And so basically, I've always been involved somehow for some weird reason as a content producer and in in the media space. Um, It just is a weird thing that you just not I've just for some reason naturally gravitated towards. Um, And that still to this day is true. So digital kung fu being um, a tech startup that builds the sales pipelines for technology businesses. We'll talk about we'll talk about that in just a little bit, but I want to get onto the podcasting thing. So you mm. were just sitting around one day. Um, were you back in this? Where did you first come across podcasting? Um, I was actually doing research. I was sitting in a dead end job for my sins. I was kind of in that middle ground, trying to work out what my next entrepreneurial play was going to be. Um, at a big ad ad agency, I was head of innovation for twelve companies in the group there, uh, but 
deeply unfulfilled and kind of had that itch to go and start something new. So I was Googling um, just trends, media trends, what was happening out there, etc. And podcasting in America was just huge, but locally there was no real market to speak of, no real data. And so I thought, you know what, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get, uh, do a couple of interviews, maybe two or three absolute most, you know, I'm not going to do more than that just to get some pre-launch content put together for a, a new content platform whose uh, vision was really to put big agency thinking into the hands of the small business, uh, small businessman who can't afford the big uh, fees of big agencies, but can easily execute on the knowledge capital that exists there. And that's really where it started. And my first interview was with Arthur Goldstack. It was a complete shambles. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, and I really, really sucked at podcasting. It was, mm -hmm. um, it was a very real thing for me because weirdly enough, my listeners today wouldn't say so, but I'm very much a, an introvert. I actually like um, having conversations only where there's a microphone present. Otherwise, if there's any other kind of environment, I tend to only hang out with people I know and like. Otherwise, strangers are bad. <laughs> well, but, strangely enough, I'm very much like that. That's, the same. So, somebody said to me, why are you on radio? I said, I love people. I just don't want to have to see them all the time. <laughs> So, you know. <laughs> yeah, but that's absolutely true. And so, but the thing about sucking at something is that it gives you the chance to start getting good at something. What did you start with? I mean, did you go out and, and I mean, I suppose what we would South Africans have a reference, the Joe Rogan show, mm. London Real. Yes. Um, did you did you look at those things and go, okay, I need the big fancy desks like, like we have here at Mix, um, or did you just start? With, with a little recorder. I, I started over Skype because even though, um, like Arthur, for instance, he actually stays in Joburg, like me, and uh, I still did it over Skype because I didn't actually want to meet the guy <laughs> face to face. It was that bad. Um, and, um, you know, I used to, you know, script all the interviews. It wasn't really a conversation. It was really bad, basically. Yeah. Um, and the funny thing was that the, the more I did it, the better at it I became. And instead of trying to, you know, invite people onto the show, people started being referred um, and it, I just got lucky. The media space moved uh, exponentially. We did a whole bunch of research, funnily enough, into podcasting last year. It was supported by uh, traditional radio, Jacaranda, uh, East Coast Radio, etc. Did a lot of online direct marketing surveys and stuff. Podcasting is way bigger than people think it is. But not South African podcasting. Because I know lots of people that listen to, to international podcasts. Mm. I mean, they, they would listen to just about anything. And to a large degree, we've, we've kind of... Uh, the spirit of podcasting is the lone wolf going out and starting the show, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, what I've done and what a lot of people have done is literally turned a radio show into a podcast that's as it. well. Yep. And I kind of, you know, there's that part of me that's a bit of a purist. And, and even as far as I'm concerned, I'm like, yeah, you're not really a podcaster. Yeah. You're more of a broadcaster that, that just gives out content on another platform. Um, but, I mean, you talk about it, your eyes light up. It's, it's a passion. I mean, I can see that. How long has the Matt Brown show been going for? Um, three years now. Okay. And uh, your first podcast, you said, was not the best. Uh, how was the, the second and third? Pre pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> are they still the, available online? They are, and please do not go there. <laughs> Whatever you do, it's still cringe. I, someone actually mailed me the other day. She said, you know, I finally listened to all your podcasts. I was like, no, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> but um, but today it's a very different animal. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's built myself a network all over the world. Um, I pretty much interviewed all the who's who of the South African business space. Um, and it's grown into something that's bigger than myself. The only thing that I, I probably regret over the last three years is that it's called the Matt Brown Show <laughs> <laughs> because it's got my name attached to it. And, and my hope is that one day it would be bigger than myself. But unfortunately, it's attached to, to my name. The Matt Brown Show brought to you by Fred Bloggs, probably. Uh, exactly. Don't know if that did work so much. Uh, no, I've got to say, I wanted to say initially, good evening, gentlemen, but I am trying to ignore the other two people in the studio because they are standing behind cameras. Did you, have you now moved into that? Are you now, is yes. it now like a, a kind of the South African version of the Joe Rogan show? That's pretty much where it's, it's evolved, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I started off doing interviews in boardrooms, then it started, I started doing live shows. 
Um, and, you know, in front of 600 people when the Bitcoin price was at its peak uh, in January last year. So we're doing live shows that were broadcast all around uh, the world. So I think the last count was like to 52 countries live, you know, mm -hmm. 600 people. So it came a long way in a very short period of time. I grew a hell of a lot in that period in order to kind of hold off. I mean, it's a crazy thing. We shot a t uh, CNBC shot a TV show inside my show with 600 people uh, live in the audience. It was crazy. And so it's just naturally, you naturally have to push the boundaries. I guess in the radio paradigm, it's quite easy and cut to stay comfortable, but I get, you know, uncomfortable with being comfortable. Mm. And so I try and push things further and further. And so we, so part of doing the live shows was obviously video because we were live broadcasting. And I think on one show, we had uh, a viewership in 80 countries around the world. And I was like, well, you can't really ignore the numbers. And so then now we've started to do the video formats of the show. And off the back of that, I think, in the, which was the numbers? I think, I, think I, went, I think it was like 150 odd thousand minutes were streamed in, in about eight weeks. And then uh, Amazon, we did a deal with Amazon Prime. So the show is now available on Amazon Prime. So it's just naturally extended beyond, you know. You've thought a lot about this and you thought mm. a lot more about it than, than, than sort of your average podcaster would. So let's talk to me about average podcasters. Now, South Africa, are there a lot? Are there not a lot? Because um, you mentioned something else. I mean, there, there's a lot of dead and dying podcasts with three episodes. Mm -hmm. um, you've built yourselves up. How, how do you sort of on your podcast, do you go, oh, okay, I can see how many downloads I've had this week? Um, yeah, I've got a team of, I think, four people working full time on the show. Uh -huh. You know how much hard work it is. And that's the point. It's like when you start something like this, uh, you have to be in it for at least a year because it is hard work. You're still refining your craft, right? You still have to build a, an audience, but building an audience today is harder than it's ever been before. By the way, I've never spent a cent on advertising, not one cent. So this has all been organic and just through hard work and perseverance. That is pretty darn Im impressive. Mm. I mean, so, so nothing, no Google AdWords, nothing. no Facebook advertising, You've just grown, but obviously you've got a huge social media reach. You must have now. Uh, yeah, well, it's mainly on the on the audio formats of the show. Yeah. So obviously with podcast syndication networks and obviously your big ones like Google Play, Spotify and all that stuff, but it's hard to reach them. In other words, they can reach me, but it's hard to reach them. So mm -hmm. it's, it's frustrating the way that the ecosystem is built, which is interesting because to your earlier point, there's a graveyard of podcasters that started and then failed. Because I love it when people say, you know, one day I, I want to start a podcast. And like, fantastic. You come and speak to me in six months time. Because mm -hmm. like 99 out of 100 of them would have stopped because of the hard work it requires to actually do great content consistently. Well, I think that's the point though. It's the consistently part of it. That, mm. is, that is the problem. Mm. Um, how how big would you say the podcast market is in South Africa? I mean, I don't I don't see unless you can tell me differently. Mm. Uh, advertisers beating down podcasters' doors here. It's certainly not like they do in the states mm. with the likes of a Pat Flynn. I'm sure you know who Pat. Yeah, Pat, Pat. yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the total addressable market from our research um, is 16 million people. That's the addressable market, the total number of people who have the availability to access a podcast today via smartphone. Weekly consumption was, I think, 6 million people listen to podcasts per week. In South Africa? In South Africa. It's, look, the data doesn't lie. Um, in fact, all what? the data is on our website. I can give you the, the link for the show notes to go and have a look. We looked at consumption attitudes, where they consume podcasts. Is data an issue? Which, by the way, it isn't. Um, everyone says, oh, no one's going to, in South Africa, developing economy, like data, no one's going to yeah, pay for the data. Data is expensive. But here's the thing. People will pay for content they want. That's the key thing. And entertainment is the most popular category, then followed by news, etc. And when you look at the, the categories of content that people consume in the on-demand space, meaning podcasting, it's, it pretty much mirrors what you will find in radio. And in fact, what people, how people view podcasts is an extension of radio. The only difference being is that they want, pod, they want content on, on their terms. Uh -huh. So, you know, like we, you played music just now. It's like, yeah. well, what if I didn't want that? 
Yeah. They want a different listening experience. It's they just want talk or just want information yeah. or just want a certain genre of music. Absolutely. And also they're listening to podcasts in uh, in different like sort of situations and contexts while they're running on the road, while they are cooking. <laughs> it's a funny thing. <laughs> they were like, where do you listen to podcasts the most? At home was, of, like, I think, the second highest category outside of in, in the car or while uh, transport, you know, Transporting yeah, that's, that's and working me. I whatever. listen. I listen when I'm in the car. Yeah, definitely. it's like you download on Wi-Fi and you listen in the car, and then you download again at the office. Any advice for aspiring podcasters? Don't quit. Don't, don't give, quit. Don't give up. I mean, the the reason why those six businesses of mine failed was simply because things got really hard for me in whatever way that was, either financially or just because I fell out of love with the vision that I was that I had for the business. And every and that's the only reason why people really quit at the end of the day is because they decide to to stop. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why you have this graveyard of, you know, could have been podcasts, you know, the land of like crushed dreams. <laughs> Perhaps we should start a support group. We should. We should. <laughs> you could actually do very well. <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked about the Matt Brown show. So let's just wrap that up. If people want to find out about the Matt Brown show, because there's some great content. I'm a little jealous. Got to tell you. But anyway, <laughs> we're, we're getting there. I aspire to the kind of content that Matt has on his show. Where, where, do, where, do, where does somebody go to get it? Uh, you can just go to mattbrownshow.com or just Google Matt Brown Show or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. We're everywhere, basically. So iTunes, Stitcher. iTunes, literally everywhere. iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, the, yeah. whole, the whole shebang. So the Matt Brown Show or just mattbrownshow.com. That's the one. mattbrownshow.com. Cool. Talk to me about digital kung fu. You said... You said a little bit in the beginning and then you, mm. you used words that confused me. So <laughs> <coughs> for so the slow kids in the class, what does Digital Kung Fu do? We build uh, sales and marketing pipelines for technology businesses. So we're in the B2B space. Um, we are just over a year old. We've just won the Best Tech Startup in Africa Award. And, did, and you say this, you know, <laughs> just over a year. That's, that's flipping amazing. Thank you, yeah. It's impressive. It's still, we're very humbled by it. It all kind of just happened. It wasn't even something we necessarily orchestrated. We were nominated to uh, to submit an entry. You still don't know to this day uh, who on the judging panel did that. Um, and uh, yeah, we fortunately walked away with the award about four weeks ago. So that that's a big feather in your cap. Has Okay, so explain this again to me, but seriously, like I was for. Mm. Um, so it's business to business, mm -hmm. sales... What do you do? Lead generation? That's it, yeah. So lead generation and then we do account-based marketing, which is one of the very white-hot trends at the moment in the B2B sort of sales space. Just a quick, uh, let's just do this before we continue any more. If you'd like to uh, have a chat to Matt, pass any comments, you can SMS us 41348. SMS is charged at 1 Rand 50. Alternatively, WhatsApp us 0848 That's 0848 Love to hear from you. Any questions from Matt, anything you'd like us to ask him, you're more than welcome to do so. Right, now we've gotten rid of that. Let's uh, continue. Thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm hoping that somebody can give you some intelligently difficult questions. Um, but uh, so explain how this is going to benefit me as a bit. Is this for big corporates or do you, do you care about the little guy as well? We do. We do. Um, but importantly, we only work with tech businesses. So either technology groups like BCX or software OEMs or original equipment manufacturers. So mm -hmm. like Microsoft. Um, or first distribution, the distributors of Azure and products like that. But in essence, what, what we do is we help technology business get their story across to their customers or their intended customers. So tech people are really awesome at technology, not so great at getting that uh, story across. So really what makes Digital Kung Fu different and what we've built a lot of IP on is storytelling. So stories, are, just like podcasting, stories are make complicated things understandable memorable and relatable and sticky and so that really is what um, makes our clients excited to work with digital kung fu and our ninjas there it's an it's an amazing thing that you're saying this because um i do a lot of work with uh, a mate of mine um, we spoke briefly off here about it the sales institute mm. and in the sales space um we, we're using a lot of storytelling techniques now yep. because that is the thing that's, that's working. The old way of selling is gone. It's dead. It doesn't mm. work anymore. 
Yes. So storytelling in the tech space as well. You must freak these people out when you tell them to tell stories. <laughs> Well, look, I think I think what they're excited about is seeing their stories come to life. Mm-hmm. And what's really interesting is that we go to great lengths to say that we're not an agency, even though we have digital in, in our brand name, Digital Kung Fu. It's just that, you know, we're fast. Agencies, literally, we were in a meeting with a big telco last week with the agency from a global advertising agency in the room, literally saying, we can't do this. <laughs> Please, can you do it sort of thing? Um, and that's why we got the phone call. It's because storytelling is one of the age old skills that human beings are just hardwired for. It's like if you know that a story essentially is a sequence of events that leads to something and you know that it's formulaic inherently and there's a number of different formulas that you can use, the story brand, there's uh, the hero's journey by Joseph Campbell, and there's many, many others. Did you did you do the story brand thing? Yes, we did. Jump. Yeah. Okay, but the, your version of story brand, not the, well, the the book story brand. No, no, no. So basically, what we've done is we did a lot of research into storytelling form formulas, essentially, and frameworks, mm-hmm. and we've kind of bastardized that now, and mel- and kind of um, really put it together with something called category design. So. Category design essentially is the process of marketing a problem that a market doesn't know they have yet. Or if they are are experiencing the pain already, you're putting a different label on the problem that they have. And so the insight basically is if you market a a problem better than the competition, you'll win. So for instance, in our space, while we might be doing lead generation, we we say, the first thing that I said was that we build sales and marketing pipelines. We're pipeline builders. And so it's, it's a, in other words, it's a, it's a clever way of creating a white space or blue ocean as the blue ocean strategy book, um, uh, essentially tabled as a point of view. Um, but really it's about creating a, an, a space that you can own because right now in the B2B space, it's super cluttered. Um, there's every, a lot of people are just kind of numb with advertising. So advertising doesn't work. And so really it's about story and bringing that across at scale. And you're sitting here telling a radio person that advertising doesn't work. Mm. The sad part is I agree with you. Well, it's, it's, it, it is a scary thing because, I mean, if you think about it, we're on a radio station and unless you can make your ad stand out in some way, mm. um, it's just you're getting the clutter all the time. Yeah. So, so what you're doing is brilliant. Now, now just I got to stop you there because sure. I'm looking at the T-shirt. Where did digital kung fu come from? <laughs> Basically, uh, it's martial arts for businesses. Mm -hmm. So it's a skill set that anyone can adopt and learn or any brand can learn and adopt and execute. Um, And that was pretty much the premise. Okay. Mm. Good stuff. So now, when when you're doing this digital kung fu for people, (laughs) it's not enough for you just to do digital kung fu. But I want to get on to the next thing. Um, oh, will this chat be online? And if so, where? I need to listen again and have my business partner listen too. That's from Marcia. It will be online on uh, a number of places. If I can get my website back up and running, it'll be on uh, whatsinvolved.co.za or whatsinvolved.com. Mm-hmm. Um, and your website? Um, yeah, it'll be digitalkungfu.co.za. Or um, you can just grab the show off our YouTube channel or on our podcast. We'll resyndicate it for you. There we go. And that should be in the next couple of days, eh? Yeah. Good, yeah. Mine will hopefully be in the next couple of days as well. He says, fingers crossed. So there you go, Marcia. Uh, love your business partner to listen to it. Love that kind of feedback and info as well. So how... Wh- <laughs> I'm a digital, I'm a tech startup company, okay? Um, a product of one of these uh, business incubator places and I'm now going, okay, I've made this brilliant thing, app. Do I come to you and say, how do I sell it? No. 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 Okay, so what do I do then? I'm not the kind of person you want to speak to. No, no, not really. We need we work with technology businesses that have some kind of product in market already and some revenue. Aha, so, okay. so we're in the business of really getting products to market at scale and and essentially in helping clients capture as much market share as possible. So startups are great to work with. We have we have consulted for the last two years with Startup Bootcamp. Um, I know personally all the venture capitalists in South Africa just through the podcast, uh, the guys from Knife Capital, uh, Clive Butcode, Kalon Venture Partners, etc. So we're actually working with Knife Capital um, now as part of their Grindrod Accelerator program, which just launched here in Johannesburg. Um, and so startups are an interesting space. It's tough out there. I mean, we're still cutting our teeth in many respects. It's never really over. 
So like the, the definition of an entrepreneur is someone who wants to jump out of an airplane with nothing but a silkworm thinking that he's an overachiever. <laughs> So, Go on, you can do it. Make that parachute. That's it. And you have to do that. You have to build that parachute on the way down. But um, startups are an interesting space. They're just not where we um, we really, you know, specialize. All right. But that wasn't enough for you. I mean, you've, you've won the award now. You're going to be traveling overseas as well, you mentioned. Um, mm. But you are now doing two more things. And the one thing you mentioned to me is something called, and I'm, I'm noticing the martial arts theme here, which I'm liking, is the Dreamer's Dojo. What is the Dreamer's Dojo? The Dreamer's Dojo is essentially a giving back initiative. So mm -hmm. it is based on the insight that the schooling system is producing the youth for irrelevance. They're a production line for irrelevance, um, especially in the context of the world that we're about to inherit, which is largely dominated and driven through exponential technology. And uh, McKinsey Global Institute published a study recently saying that by 2030, about a billion jobs are going to be automated. So it's the whole thing is, well, you know, how do you create relevance in that paradigm of thinking. This is this whole fourth industrial revolution that we're talking about and everybody's going, oh, it's Africa. It's not going to touch us. Well, you know, I spoke to Salim Ishmael, one of the founders of Singularity, um, funny enough, at Africa Tech Week where we won the award. Um, and what is abundantly clear is that no market is not going to be impacted by this. And so if you want financial independence as an 18-year-old today, you've got to give up on the idea of the J-O-B in many respects. So the J-O-B for me means just over broke. Absolutely. And so, you know, and I've learned how to build financial independence for myself, sell businesses, fail often. And just by connecting with influencers such as yourself and other extremely, you know, popular and successful business people and you business say leaders. say the nicest things. I do, I do. <laughs> See, I dropped that in deliberately. <laughs> but <laughs> but, um, but it's it's possible for anyone. It's just that your inner game is what really matters. And so the Dreamers Dojo is a structured intervention designed to essentially expose kids to entrepre entrepreneurial mindsets at school. I think that's outstanding because for years I've said my entrepreneurial journey would have been so much easier if I was taught entrepreneurial skills at school as opposed to the stuff I was taught. Well, yeah, they taught me. I didn't necessarily learn. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but it was. And I mean, but this sounds almost, this almost smacks of a little bit of conscious capitalism on your part. Why? Because I think it's a brilliant thing to do. Conscious capital interesting term conscious capitalism so the thing for me is that i agree with you you know i i look back at the last 20 years of business and how if i just had that one conversation you know when i was about to give up with mm -hmm. someone that said matt you're here for a reason here's why don't give up that little in that one conversation could have changed the trajectory of my entire life um and so i you know i had to learn it myself there were no books about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship wasn't a thing, you know, when I started uh, starting businesses. Now today it's cool, it's sexy, it's like, I oh, know entrepreneurship, everyone wants to jump on the entre entrepreneurship bandwagon um, and they should be because today with the access to tools and information that you have at your disposal, it's incredible what you can achieve. Anybody can literally start a business and I mean online and, and in ways we haven't even thought about yet. Absolutely, but here's the thing. Entrepreneurship is something that anyone can do, but it's not for anyone. So my point of view is very simply this, is that what makes someone successful as an entrepreneur and what makes someone fail? And for me, it comes down to the operating system that you use. A set of principles that govern your decision making, regardless of what's happening outside you in the world of technology and business. Because if you know how to make decisions in the right way and understand that decisions have consequences, you start to realize that decisions are actually your ultimate power because when you truly decide to do something, the rest just takes care of itself. Just got another message in here. It says, uh, the school's idea of entrepreneurial anything is biz ec and one market day a year. Exactly. That's, so that's such a great point. That? That's, that's a hundred percent true. So here's the thing. Everybody is trying to help entrepreneurs but no one's really conducting the ecosystem. So for me, there's, there's not much that, you know, 
I can do to affect the entire ecosystem outside of the channels that I own, like the podcast or initiatives like the Dreamers Dojo. But whatever it is, I think it's important to land the point that going to a school and doing a talk is fine and it's great, but it's not enough. If you're going to create a structured intervention or activation at schools level, it needs to leave a legacy. It needs to be autonomous, self-organizing, just like Ted, the brand, (laughs) self-organizing, and it needs to live beyond what a single intervention can do. So is this up and running or is it in the process? We're still defining the structure. So for instance, I can tell you what we're currently working with. The idea being is that it's a three-day intervention. We do a call to action across the the entire country, South Africa, and we ask for for schools to submit teams of four uh, between the ages of, say, you know, 16 to 21. They must come from a math, science, engineering, or business studies background. We bring them up to Johannesburg. It's funded by someone. We're still looking for a partner in the space. And the nudge, fr- nudge, wink, wink. Yes, if exactly. You're listening. Thank you. Um, and so we we basically run the first day and land the idea of exponential relevance. What does it mean to be relevant in a world driven through exponential technology? What are these technologies that are underpinning the f- and shaping the current states of the world that we live in? Not just today, but in the future. And the second day is all about human principles for an exponential time. This is uh, the principles that I write about in my book. And then the third day is about hacking real world African problems with these teams Um, facilitated and mentored by, for instance, an organization like Singularity, not necessarily them in this case, but an organization like that with a panel winning (coughs) or adjudicating a winning uh, business case idea, that product actually then being funded and taken to the real world. But now all the the, the kids that go there become the alumni. And so then they go off and become the kind of foot soldiers for the idea around the Dreamers Dojo. And so they start to self-organize. That's the idea of a time. Fantastic idea. Fantastic idea. I want to hear more about that. So uh, we're going to have to bring you back, I'm afraid, because we're running out of time again. No problem. But I always like to ask my guests if, if they're going to give away something, if there's some value that they can give to our listeners over and above what you've already uh, given us in terms of uh, the Matt Brown Show. So you said you're going to be giving away what today? So we've got a white paper for businesses or business owners. Um, It's called Inside B2B Lead Generation. It was researched and produced by Digital Kung Fu. And really it tables how do you grow your business at scale using techniques that we've learned and applied in the worlds of some of the biggest and most successful technology companies in our portfolio. You will have my email in your inbox first thing tomorrow morning. Where do we actually go to ask for this? You can just drop me an email at uh, hello at digitalkungfu.co.za or go to our website, digitalkungfu.co.za. So hello at digitalkungfu.co.za. If you'd like to get that white paper, depends how generous Matt is feeling tomorrow morning. You may or may not get it. Um, are you going? Are you going to be generous? You're going to send out a bunch. If somebody asks, you'll give it to them. I think so. Awesome. That's the kind of stuff I like to hear. Hello at digitalkungfu.co.za. White paper on lead generation, business to business lead generation. And uh, I said I was going to ask you if you ever sleep, and the reason is just before we uh, wrap up tonight. You're writing a book as well? Yeah, well, it's done. <laughs> done? Finished? Yeah. It's you, okay, it's pub- <coughs> getting published. Yes, that's right. It's coming out. It's published already by Tracy McDonald Publishers. Um, she did Eric's book, actually. My next guest. My next guest, yeah. Um, and uh, it's coming out in July. It's called Inner Game or Your Inner Game, uh, 12 Principles for High Impact Entrepreneurs. Okay. How long did that take you? And where did you find time with all this other award-winning and stuff you were doing? Exactly. It took a year of... of Finding time somewhere. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you don't mind if I say that, but you're married as well. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. do, do you get sort of emails from your wife saying, please send recent photo so the dog won't bite you when you get home? Uh, yeah, exactly. It's hard to manage. Uh, balance is a thing that uh, is, is a myth in my world, really. I think if you're an entrepreneur, I think you, you generally battle with balance. Yeah, it's work, work, balance. Mm, yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's coming in July. I'm going to have to ask you right now, put you on the spot. I'd love to have you back. Thank you. Anytime. So uh, we can chat about the book when it's out, when it's launched, and uh, we can see exactly what it's like. We are running out of time, as I said. Uh, Matt Brown, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been a whirlwind hour, this one. Um, so you're giving away the white paper. We said hello at digitalkungfu.co.za. 
Um, oh, wait. Somebody says, um, can he choose a song since it's a half music show? No. <laughs> right. Thanks, Nick, but no. Do you want to choose a song? You can choose any song you like as long as it's Dire Straits, Romeo and Juliet. Sounds great. Do you like your big Dire Straits? In fact, that was, the, that was the song I had in mind. I thought it was, you see. We are telepathetic on this radio station. <laughs> There we go, Matt Brown. Thank you so much. Uh, you can check it out, the Matt Brown Show. Look for that uh, mattbrownshow.com. Otherwise, digitalkungfu.co.za. Love to see you back here again. Gentlemen, thanks for sticking cameras in our faces. I hope it comes out well. Um, I will need it to get passed by my agent before you actually publish that live. <laughs>